12 million Africans were ripped from their homes and sold like cattle in America. The brutal triangle trade lasted over 300 years. So what made Britain the first major European power to abolish slavery for good? Why did the British Empire, previously the biggest villain, subsequently spend huge amounts of time and money all around the world to squash the practice? And what does possibly the most famous worship song of all time, Amazing Grace, have to do with it? To answer these questions, we've got to go back. Like, way back. Okay, not quite that far back. Slavery is old. Really, really old. The idea of forced labor is older than history itself. Most civilizations have dabbled in slavery at some point. But what about your ancestors? Were they enslavers or enslaved? Well, probably both if you look back far enough. The truth is, how bad being a slave was depended a lot on when and where you lived, as the rules changed depending on who's boss. There are three main types of slavery. Indentured servitude, think working off a debt, not ideal, but with an end in sight. Chattel slavery, where you're treated as property, zero rights, zero good times. And the third type of slavery, which we'll discuss at the end. Ancient times, slavery was hard, but some domestic slaves could earn some rights. Medieval Europe saw less slavery as the church agreed slavery was wrong, but some kings side-eyed the Pope and still quietly kept on enslaving. Actually, after the fall of Rome, Europe lagged behind the Arab world. Slavery really took off with the establishment of the caliphates that unified Arabia and institutionalized the slave trade from North Africa into the Sub-Sahara and the East African coast. Then, the 1400s rolled around. Suddenly, European rulers started a race to see who could build the biggest, baddest slave trading empire. By the 1700s, the transatlantic slave trade meant over 10 million Africans had been ripped from their homes, half of them dying on horrific ships, in horrific conditions, on a horrific journey to horrible homes owned by horrible blokes with horrible amounts of money. Entire cultures were wiped out for profit. But that level of brutality creates many myths. So let's do a quick myth buster before we meet the heroes who brought this monstrosity down. The transatlantic slave trade's victims were predominantly black Africans exploited by white Europeans. This fueled racist ideologies, but slavery is much older than modern theories about race. Word check, slave comes from the Latin Slav, meaning white Eastern Europeans who had the misfortune of being enslaved by various groups throughout history from the Romans to the Ottomans. Slavery is global and crosses ethnic lines. Think enslaved Europeans in the Arab world, Aztec sacrifices of prisoners of war, Chinese slaves to Mongolian warlords, or Indian slaves institutionalized by the caste system. Even the worst systems had exceptions. Some slaveholders throughout history offered better conditions, sometimes even paths to freedom. Of course, even kind enslavement is still obviously wrong. In terms of the sheer brutality and speed with which it devastated populations, the transatlantic slave trade was uniquely horrific. But the Arab slave trade was larger and has lasted far longer. Now, we're going to explore how this brutal transatlantic trade ended, but there are two more big myths we'll bust after that. The abolition of slavery in Britain, which paved the way for the rest of the European great powers, couldn't have happened without a remarkable trio. These heroes weren't the Avengers, but they did have origin stories with profound transformations through faith. Rough seas, a storm-battered ship, a slave trader suddenly gripped by the fear of God. This wasn't some gentle conversion. Newton's change of heart was dramatic, born of desperation and a life-altering realization that his actions were a monstrous sin. As if the scales fell from his eyes, he could see the horrors he was carrying out on slaves, people, made in the image of God. It was this realization and his subsequent amazement at God's grace and forgiveness that motivated him to write the world-famous hymn, Amazing Grace. 
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. His Christian faith clarified the sin of his past, while God's grace became the fuel for his crusade to expose the horrors of the slave trade, which most ordinary people in Europe, not having Wikipedia, social media, or ChatGBT to refer to, were mostly unaware of. Newton devoted his life to becoming the slave trade's most credible whistleblower, and was in this pursuit when he met William Wilberforce. So, you're Wilberforce, a wealthy young man born into a world of privilege. Your father, a successful merchant in the thriving port city of Hull, England, a hub of international trade. Your father had some understanding of the grim realities of the slave trade, but you grew up surrounded by wealth with little awareness of the human cost behind it. Parties, politics and witty conversation filled your days. But then came the jolt. You took a gap year to travel Europe with your mentor, Isaac Milner, a professor of mathematics and president of Cambridge University. He was a deeply intelligent man and a brilliant theologian. Deep conversations about faith and the Bible sparked something in you. You plunged into studying scripture and it was like a whole new world opened up. You realized Christian faith isn't just about rituals or feeling good. The example of Christ demands action. Returning to your home in Hull, you sought out John Newton, whose rousing sermons had made local papers. Newton's raw, first-hand accounts of the industry's brutality became your torment. Newton, quickly seeing your passion and potential, took you under his wing. You found the singular purpose to which you would devote your life, to dismantle the monstrous system of slavery Newton had once been a part of. Between Newton's pulpit passion, your ornamental oratory, and some faithful finance, you were elected as an independent member of parliament in 1780. You saw abolition not just as a political battle, but as a test of faith, a chance to truly live out Christ's teaching with perseverance, regardless of the results. The party-loving heir transformed into a tireless activist, using your privilege and position as weapons in the fight for freedom. Still, you needed the final piece of the puzzle. Henry Thornton was the piece that made everything possible. He was a fabulous financier, born into banking royalty. But even amidst the riches, he was raised in a devout Christian household. For him, his faith wasn't a weekend ritual. It was woven into his upbringing, shaping a sense of right and wrong from an early age. For some, growing into a successful banker could have dulled that moral compass. But for Thornton, he was inspired by the growing evangelical movement, the Clapham sect, who were ardent social reformers. He saw his wealth as a tool entrusted by God for good, not just personal gain. His friendship with Wilberforce was the spark that ignited action. Thornton became Wilberforce's closest ally and the abolition movement's secret weapon behind the scenes. See, Thornton wasn't just the money, he was the brains. He understood the political game, the financial levers of power, and crucially, the hypocrisy at the heart of the system. While Wilberforce relied on the brute force of speeches and repetition, Thornton helped him stay one step ahead of his ruthless opponents at every turn. The empire dripping with blood money? They weren't about to let Wilberforce and his squad end their cash flow without a fight. They spread vicious rumors. Wilberforce was a traitor, an enemy of the crown. Abolition was a plot to destabilize the economy. Every time Wilberforce presented heart-wrenching evidence, testimonies from former slaves, the chilling conditions aboard ships, his opponents fired back with lies and twisted numbers. Then a crushing blow. After decades of work, Henry Thornton suddenly died in 1760, though he left much of his wealth to the abolitionists. After a relentless effort, they scored a small win in 1788, a law limiting how many enslaved people ships could carry. The pro-slavery lobby thought they'd shut the abolitionists up, while support for further measures went dry. The abolitionists had a choice, give up or change tactics. They saw how powerful Newton's story had been, 
how change starts with hearts and minds, not just politicians. Boycotts of slave-made products? Check. Petitions flooding parliament? Done. They got preachers fired up, making abolition a matter of good versus evil. They partnered with writers and activists like Thomas Clarkson, the empire's greatest strength. Public indifference was crumbling. Suddenly, politicians worried about re-election had to start listening. In 1807, after decades of relentless struggle, the unimaginable happened. The Slave Trade Act passed, outlawing the transport of slaves in the British Empire. Only months after the passage of the act, your mentor, John Newton, passed too. As he breathed his final words, I am a great sinner, but Christ is a great savior. He must have taken comfort from Jesus's words on the cross. It is finished. The mighty institution he had once fed had now suffered a mortal blow. Victory? Not quite. That 1807 law only ended the slave trade, not slavery itself. But after that first win, you didn't stop. It was time to go global. You rallied abolitionists worldwide, networking with fighters from France to America. Even as your health was failing, you became the vice president of the Global Anti-Slavery Society in 1825. From parliament to pamphlets, you never rested. For your 46 years in parliament, you never backed down. You made a promise to God, to your family, to yourself. You would see slavery abolished. All the while, your heart remained focused on the words of your mentor's hymn. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. And then something incredible happened. Slave revolts exploded in Jamaica, electrifying the public and fueling the abolitionist movement. Suddenly, the government couldn't ignore the fire that had been lit. In 1833, they caved, introducing a bill to ban slavery across the empire. On the 26th of July that year, news reached you that the bill would pass. Only three days later, you breathed your last. William Wilberforce was hailed by the government as a national hero and given a burial spot in Westminster Abbey, where royalty and British icons are usually laid to rest. True to the law, 800,000 slaves were freed in the Caribbean, and by 1838, all slaves, over a million in total, had been given their freedom. But hey, this story isn't all clean and tidy. We still have two big myths to bust. Britain's abolition movement was a major turning point, but claiming they pioneered the fight against slavery, that conveniently ignores history. For centuries, much of Christian Europe upheld the church's stance against enslaving fellow humans. And let's not forget, Japan banned slavery, for the most part, way back in 1590. Even within Africa, Christian warrior Queen Nzinga outlawed slavery in the early 1600s as she fiercely resisted Portuguese exploitation. But here's the truly disturbing myth, the one that demands our attention now. Slavery belongs to the past. That's right. It's tempting to believe that slavery is a relic of a less enlightened era, but the reality is far more grim. Modern slavery is the third type of slavery mentioned at the start. Today, there are more people enslaved than during the height of the transatlantic slave trade. An estimated 40 million people endure forced labor, forced marriages, or horrific exploitation at the hands of human traffickers, governments, and corporations. Modern slavery thrives on secrecy. In sweatshops in India and China, which have the most slaves, where desperate people toil in the shadow of the global economy, or in some of the Arab world, with the highest prevalence of modern slavery, there are forced marriages and predatory construction contracts trapping migrant laborers. Even the US has an estimated 400,000 slaves. The good news is the fight isn't over. You don't have to be a politician to make changes. Donate, volunteer, spread awareness. Supporting any organization partnered with the International Justice Mission is a great move. But I highly recommend Branches of Hope in Hong Kong, which combats modern slavery in the city on multiple fronts or support Angel Studios to gain access to the blockbuster movie Sound of Freedom, which traces the true rescues of children from human trafficking. 
While Jesus ended our slavery to sin for all time, and Wilberforce ended the greatest crime of his time, ending slavery in all its forms is a battle for our time.